Uh, Lauren Sully here, and Carrie Snow here, and then staff we have Carol Dominguez, here, Molly O'Donnell, here, and Sarah Arden, here. Let's go to item number two, approval minutes from our December 12, 2023 meeting. Do I have a motion? Motion. Second. All right, I have a motion and a second. Uh, any uh, discussion on this? All right, let's vote. All ayes? Aye. Aye. All any uh, against, nays? Abstentions? All right, the motion passes. Number three, public amendment to be heard. Uh, number four, organizational updates. I'm not sure that we have any organizational updates. Not okay, okay. Wow. Alright. Mm -hmm. Number five, development project updates. Um, so I will go ahead and take this one. Um so village village on May. I'm just gonna call it the village so I don't <laughs> have to go in between them. Um we issue MTP on Friday. The first move out start on Monday and construction starts on Tuesday. So we're doing all the last minute, um, making sure we've got submittals from the construction firm going through architecture and making sure everybody's ready to rock. Um, we're gonna do move outs, like two a day, and then the construction guys are gonna come in and start demoing units right behind them. So it's gonna kind of be rolling for this first phase and, and ongoing, but that's how we'll get started. So. Um, they are getting everything ready to go to start staging across the street um, at that empty lot that is across from the pump house. And then we're just making sure that they've got their things like our flooring, like the flooring that we selected, suddenly the lead time is too long to match up with our schedule. So rather than change the schedule, we're changing the, the flooring color. So um, nothing major, it's all a medium brown that we're picking for flooring. So. Just all of those last minute type of things just to make sure there's no schedule to pass. So getting everything ready to go for that. We're also working with the city comms team to um, get messaging out because there's multiple projects happening downtown over this next year and just coordinating messaging around parking and um, where construction will be and will there be any sidewalk closures or, or street closures, anything like that. So we're trying to get some um, messaging out there and so you might see some stuff in the paper because um, the text call is, is already asking, like, what's this and that? And so there might be some, some kind of traffic on that. Um, everything else on the finance side for the project is all set and ready to go. We're just getting our bank accounts all set up. We're going to do our first draw here for the invoices that we've been paying since closing. And everything there is all lined up. Um, the residents seem excited. No last minute, you know anxious feelings that we've been hearing about it most mostly is excitement so i think we've I maybe mean, been working with them for almost two years to prepare um so we have some as soon as i get the final flooring sample settled i've got some mock-ups of, of what the finishes are that we'll take over to the building so everyone can kind of see and and um, just play around with them so trying to do everything we can on that front the relocation team has been amazing. Um, it is so different than Aspen Meadows just because we have true capacity and um, professional experts that do this every day. And so that is going incredibly smooth. Everyone in the first round has had their one-on-one -on -one meetings with the relocation team, and that's been happening for a while. And they're starting to be one-on-one -on -one meetings for the phase two move outs here this week, um, and just keeping everything moving right along. Um, I think that's all the updates on Village Domain, unless there's questions about that one. I do not start seeing some progress. Um, for our Ascent Echo Crossing project, okay, so what did we use to be since December meeting? So uh, there was, recall, a $3 million gap on the Early Childhood Education Center. Um, and so we have filled that partially with the city has brought in about $525,000 of ARPA funds. We were successful at getting $150,000 of worthy cause funds. I may have reported that not last month, but just in case I didn't. Um, we requested about seven fifty, dollars so still grateful, um, but we have more work to do. Um, we applied the Dola Strong Communities Infrastructure Grant, 
and had, we were one of their first interviews, and they had a big, they were very much oversubscribed. We had one of the first interviews and the, the energy felt very positive, and so we were very hopeful, but we did not get a big award of strong communities infrastructure. So um, we have, just Friday, we finally got our invitation to apply to the Colorado Health Foundation, requested $2 million, and we're still working with the Longmont Community Foundation. They want to participate, we just have to figure out the mechanism and how it would work on their side. Um, otherwise, we've uh, contacted Boulder County Sustainability to see if they could work with their budget allocations of sustainability tax to help fund some of the all electric nature and the heat pumps and um, things like that would, would still help the overall gap. So we're still working on filling the funding. Um, and we still have some time, but we're trying to get even more creative. Um, otherwise, design is in full force because they have a pretty aggressive schedule to get building permit by July. And so um, working through design elements and um, making sure that we work with the city planning side and, and public works to make sure that we're getting quality submittals in that turn around quick. That's the idea. And what's a, so what's the shortfall right now? Um, we said about we got about seven hundred, so two point three. Okay. So we're still trying to fill. So if you don't get all of that by the time you open, will the child care center be able to open or not? We need the funding to be able to include it in the construction. I think that we have not yet started talking about the true backup plan because we've got a lot of opportunities out there still. Um, the Colorado Health Foundation, we are quite hopeful about, and that's the biggest size one. Um, but I think what we would start to talk about next is um, what about a shell? Because it's still still most advantageous to get the shell in. How could we do work with the funding that we do have to do as much as we can? Uh, but we have not yet started that in full force. So. Questions about a cent? And then we have um, we have our our um, donated land. I'm sorry, not the donated land. The vacant land at the Royal Mobile Home Park that we still we're just holding. But we also tonight council is going to be considering a land donation at 19th and Terry Street as part of an IH satisfaction. Uh, inclusionary housing requirement satisfaction that will sit just like Royal if it goes through and is approved and, and the agreements are all done in 2024. It would sit like Royal where it's in city ownership for the moment, but that could be a long-term land banking plan that involves LHA eventually. Um, I mean, this is projects here. We're going to talk about Recovery Cafe in a moment. So not related to LHA, uh, but property that started out as LHA tonight on the council agenda. Um, you will see a housing project that we're taking for that. So if you remember, we purchased nine acres of property associated with Costco redevelopment. We're looking at affordable housing. Um, since then, we've purchased an additional 7.2 acres of property. Um, to give you a sense of the deal that we got on the Costco property. We paid $3.45 a square foot. On the seven acres, we paid $10 a square foot. That was all, so the nine acres was definitely affordable. The seven acres was conditioned upon obtainable housing being built from the landowner. Um, the property appraised at like 1875 a square foot. So if that sort of puts into perspective the deal that we got. Um, and it really was driven by the property owner wanting affordable on one side and attainable on other and willing to do that deal. Um, we told you all we changed from looking at the rental side to the um, home ownership side. And I'm telling you this because I think it's good for this board to be aware of everything we're doing with housing. And also, if we need support, we may reach out to you all to say we need help. Um, <coughs> it's getting dicey with neighborhoods and things. Um, so what we put together is a project to build um, 188 for sale owner-occupied units 
Um, let's say plus or minus three because we're still going through it. Elements and designs can change things. Uh, right around 40% of those houses will be permanently deed restricted affordable housing units. So that's going to be um, about 55 units that <clears throat> will be under 80% AMI. So the price points, just to give you a sense, is on those homes. Give me a second. And while you do that, I'll give the numbers on the land. So the city used all leverage funding, no local dollars, for 16 total acres at 4.6 million, but the value of the land is 13.1. So we got a screw the deal. Um, Did you guys sign off at IGA to have the city of Boulder manage? We have our own, we're the only ones, but okay. this was designed from the beginning. We don't participate, so this is the IGA for um, compliance specifically on home ownership at the moment for smaller communities that are building IH programs but don't necessarily have the capacity to do the long term compliance with it. We do that in house. Yeah. Okay. So we helped, we supported it, we helped them kind of okay. craft it, but then they've taken it from there. Okay. okay. So to give you uh, an example uh, on the 15, we call it the 15 foot affordable town. So, A, let me back up. Um, what's different about this, the interest, this was a, um, uh, what do you call it, a, um, drop the word? I don't know what you're going to. Unsolicited proposal oh, yeah. that they okay, brought good. to us. Um, what, what intrigued us about this is all of the units are actually over a thousand square feet. So when we've seen these, this product built like in Bertha, you will see 750 square feet. So I think everything's over a thousand and that's something that was important to us. The sale price on it is, uh, for the 15 foot affordable townhome is 284,000. For the affordable townhome is 300,000. And then when we get into the attainable side, um, well, let me, let me back up. Uh, 295 and 319 to 4 real group fees, which that, if we're still trying to figure that out. Um, the attainable side will run from 412 to $480,000. So, this project's taken a lot of bandwidth uh, as we were working on the other projects. Part of the challenge on it was we figured out at the end that if we wanted to just do attainable, attainable is pretty easy. Um, as long as you can get land and fee waivers, attainable starts penciling out. When you draw the affordable into it, it changes the volume completely. And when you have a 40% of affordable in that development, it really stretched us in how we figured it out. So, so generally we're putting in land, we're putting in fee waivers. Um, and then we're recommending to the council to put in six million dollars of affordable and attainable housing grants over five years, which is about half a million, a little over half a million um, each year. But we know there's other options, and so we've been talking to the state about Prop 123 funds. I'm talking to the county about their new affordable and attainable uh, yeah. tax that they've created. And, and so kind of, we're kind of butting into that a little bit early. Um, so that's going tonight. And if, we're not, if it passes, we'll have a second reading in two weeks. Um, but we're hoping that if it does pass tonight, we'll actually start construction later this year. That actually, I think, balances in with what the reason why I wanted to bring it up is it balances with the work that we're doing on the rental side in a sense because what it, I think we're starting to do by building this is that we're now expanding that pipeline. So let's take a sip where we have families. If we can get families in and start working with them. And they can buy. And then we get them ready to buy because that's probably the biggest challenge that, I mean, there is a lot of anxiousness with the, in the underwriting on this one. Pool of buyers. Because of the pool of buyers and you know, things that can just, you can have somebody qualified and then something happens and they're not. So I bring this up because I think when we look especially at Ascent and potentially even at Aspen Meadows, um, <clears throat> we may want to start working with the people that are in those units. 
and having conversations about getting them qualified to buy so we can start sliding in the home ownership and building wealth. Do our residents participate a lot in the pipeline program? Um, is that the, we do the, the one where you save and then it gets matched and then you can use it for education or purchasing a home? Let's talk about that. Yeah. I don't think I know very much about it. Okay. But we do have, uh, we send everybody that participates on the city side programs for rehab or other affordable housing type items go through Boulder County's um, personal finance counseling, which is, we also call it housing counseling, just preparing um, people for home ownership. So we would do that certainly for these. Um, but this is this is a very high risk project from a developer perspective. So um, we built in a lot of ways for us to work through it if we need to. Um, and that really ties to the attainable fee waiver program, which is brand new as of November. Um, this is the first project that's going to be um, using it. And that is also part of the approvals from council tonight is 100% uh, fee waiver on all these units to make it happen. Yeah, so we're pretty excited about it. I don't think there's been a project like this built in the state. If you all have heard of anything like this, let me know. Um, and the attainable is not restricted at all. No, it is. No, it, it is, it is the attainable will so be we have, we have 10 year deed restrictions and we, we've uh, painted uh, a lot of this. With, I mean, this is really creating stuff because it doesn't exist is we have a 10-year rolling deed restriction so if you're in it for 10 years you can sell it and you can sell it at what would be market value for that property that's the wealth building component but once it. it changes hands within 10 years it resets it resets i like that so, because i i don't i never understood why you would let someone gain a windfall right because the idea of living in a town home for 10 years is pretty pretty usual right whereas like me in a one bedroom condo starting a family we were never going to stay there long term the point really for like a permanently deed restricted affordable for sale unit is really it's for housing security and so that you're not subject to rent increases and you're it's, it's more of a protection when you get into this level it's more like you need some of the people that can do starter homes and and prepare them to enter the market and then keep that rolling so it's balancing Letting people generate the wealth with also making sure the city investment is, is helps as many people as possible. Yeah, now if you sell it and you sell it to someone who um, qualifies, then you're right. It just resets the 10 years. So we think we've diversified in the fact that 40% of affordable is permanently deed restricted. This, you have a 10 year deed restriction. Let's say you have someone that's in the affordable or their job situation changes and they can move into the attainable then as long as they're in that category, you can take whatever equity is built up within those AMI points as they're moving over time. So no matter what happens, people can't take equity out. Yeah. Because of the underwriting and the reduction in, in the buyer pool, um, we did, in this case, have to negotiate a buyout provision at year seven. And so, um, because the underwriters were really concerned that it would limit the pool, because it's already limited anyway. And um, so at year seven, eight, and nine, you can buy out of it, but you have to pay back a percentage of the equity gain if you sell it to the open market. And that was specifically to satisfy the limit requirements. And, um, and that's like what we modeled it to 60, 50, $40, some version. It's not bad, but it's enough that it'll reframe people and how they want to sell it. And that's a negotiation of this deal that that's not built into our attainable yeah. program. I mean, we built in a flexibility option for future projects that if they need something like this, get them the right and we can negotiate it. And the whole reason if we agree to it is because they're putting 40% affordable on it. Mm -hmm. And so that's a big piece that we were trying to figure out. Um, there is there are preferences, so you can't put right of first refusals under fair housing laws. But there are preferences, and so part of the negotiation is because if the if the city is putting in X amount of money, we get a preference on the housing on that percentage of the total value for people who work for the the city because those are city housing units. 
for all of the units. It's a preference for people who work in Longmont. Um, so what we were hearing from our business community is that there's not any options for their staff to, to purchase homes here. And so the whole intent of the attainable housing programs is to build housing stock for people that um, work in Longmont. So again, that's a preference. Um, and what it looks like for us is we're probably going to go through a lottery process because we think there's going to be so much interest in this that instead of you know just first in, first out, we're probably going to look at a lottery process initially, uh, but have people ready to slide in if things start falling out. Um, we've also thought about looking at a land trust, um, land trust party. The problem is the interest rates kind of just blew that through the water, blew that out of the water. So um, on the affordable side, and. Um, so yeah, that's what's going in uh, tonight. And we hired the city side, hired a home ownership position. She started yesterday. Her name is Katie, so we now have two Katie. Two Katie's, one one Katie. Katie that changed her name for the office. So, <laughs> um, three Katie's, but down to two. Um, so she started yesterday. We're really excited, but she's going to help us with this pool of buyers and and working through our our lottery system specifically on this one. Again, through the whole development process, but and then we have two operational, maybe organizational issues. So there's like two positions open right now. That's right. Um, the assistant director position that we budgeted, um, and then we also is it, oh, well, no. yeah. So we posted um, a position for. What's the code? What's the title on that one? Housing investment manager. Yeah, housing investment manager. Uh, we we're pretty sure. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, one of our staff person and then it got poached to go to Greeley. Um, and what we're finding is that places that don't have affordable housing programs are. What's interesting is they're starting to mimic what we're doing, and. Uh, so organizational updates, that's like front and center for me, is that, oddly enough, I think now people aren't looking at Boulder and Boulder County. They're, they're really starting to look at what we're doing and how we're approaching it, which scares me. Um, and so I'm talking with the council tonight about organizational updates. And so yeah, where people are getting posts from our organization on a weekly basis. And, um, so we're in a dog fight. So those positions are open. My goal is to hire them as soon as possible. Uh, we put, we open those as open into a bill um, because I got to provide relief for Molly and all of this, and we need to start focusing on higher level sort of that future aspirational, and uh, we just need some help. So. So we also think that Prop One Two Three, the attention on housing generally funding sources coming out for housing, even though they're not all here yet, um, there are communities that are gearing up. And so they're going to be very competitive to get people that can come in and build stuff for them um, that they might not have had before. So that's our take on on why Greeley is able to do this. <laughs> but um, so change is coming, but it's, it's going to be good. We've so, got the overall team and we can handle it. So. I just have a comment which may be inaccurate. If I recall correctly, it seems to me that the uh, governor has indicated that one of his priorities is that we have affordable housing within a 200 to 300,000 range. If that's the case, then I think we're at the leading edge on that. Yeah. This Mustang alone, which is probably not going to be called Mustang, it's just been called that in general terms for a while. It's called Mustang because that was the project name that we gave to Costco because when they can't be public, you give them yeah. special names. So it's just kind of Mustang. Um, but 60 of the units would qualify under our Prop 123 counts. So our the city's goal till the end of 2026 is 304 units. So this would be 20% of that. That's not a perfect calculation because this is going to be phased in and there's probably not all of them will hit this. Um, this three-year cycle, but it would hit the next one. But it's still significant. 
probably the for a long lot. I mean, in this one project, we will have built more, of, probably more affordable house for sale, affordable housing um, units in one project than we probably have in 15 years through our traditional pro pro program. So, and, and and just so you all know, the modeling on this is there's a lot of folks that I've been talking to that are waiting to see this because they think there's an opportunity that if we can show how it works, um, there may be people who own significant, significant parcels of land, let's say 10 acres, 10 to 15 acres, that are sitting back there going, if it works and the deal structure works and we can use it to benefit our employees, they may be willing to put their land in as sort of a contribution in, in taking that. So. Um, this is really set in the stage, and then I think is if we can ever start seeing bigger parcels from the LHA side, I was thinking about this this weekend, um, is maybe how do we have more of a mixed development in terms of having some rental units, some for sale units, and working together. So that's why I brought this to you all, because um, we're going to learn a lot through this, but we're going to learn fast and know that we need to get the next project ready. Plus, we know LIHTC going forward until LIHTC is funded more than it is, which there's no indication that it might be. Um, you got to be really creative to get an award from this point on. The standard standard project without something creative attached is not looking very attractive compared to how many are out there trying to get really creative. So. On those affordable housing units that are deed restricted, can you elaborate a little bit on more? You said it resets after 10 years. The affordables are permanently. Affordables are permanent. permanent. So, attainable. Attainable has a reset. So, so just walk me through the process. So, if somebody buys these affordable units and they sell it, they can keep some of the equity and some of it goes back to the city, or how, so how does that work? On the affordable ones, yeah. the city already has a, a calculation that's based on um, like a percent percentage growth and it's based on incomes, HUD incomes at the time versus back then. And it's a calculation that we've been using for years and years. We might be looking at that. I, I would like to look at that and just do that as a, as a project probably this year, hopefully, since we're planning for this. But generally, on the attainable side, if you purchase um, a unit that's affordable to 100% AMI, then, and it goes between 80, 0.1 to 120% AMI. If you buy it at 100% AMI, if you stay for 10 years, you can sell it at market rate and keep all your proceeds. If you sell it at year five, then you use the city's maximum sales price limits that we update every year based on market conditions and, and a ton of data. And you can sell that at that same 100% AMI price level. <clears throat> and the new person that buys that, that income qualifies, triggers a new 10 year restriction. And, and you so, get to keep everything that you gain up to that max as price. this number has been moved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then we built it where it doesn't make sense to have in this category of units, it doesn't make sense to have a, it permanently there. So it's either 30 years or three sales, whichever comes first. Because at 30 years, you're starting to need to maybe refi and do updates. like a, updates and or reset. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, exactly. mm -hmm. From a buyer pool perspective, and this might help <clears throat> from an employee retention and things like that too, but does the city have any kind of a matching down payment program? We do have a down payment program. It is home funded, so federal, and it has been extremely challenging to use in the last five years of our market. We have not had a single person be able to use it in the last two years. Um, and so we're with this new home ownership position, we want that person to look at our existing program, see if there's any ways we can make it more flexible to actually be used. Um, or my goal is, as we've got these funding sources coming in, starting a nest egg of hopefully creating our own DPA program that's more locally funded with, that matches our market more. Um, that's a long-term goal, and it would take some time to ramp it up. Um, but those are ideas that we want this person to start formulating. Um, so yes, officially there is one. We also do have a local lender that does the Start to Home program, um, and that is for Longmont residents, and you it helps with 
down payment and favorable uh, rates, as favorable as they can muster at this point in time, but also uh, working with the realtor relationships to get more of a, a different fee set up, trying to make it easier. So there's, we're hoping to partner with them to on this. There are, there's also a program that came out of Long Park Economic Development Partnership, and it's um, home to. This is what, that's it. Start to home. Start to home. So that that's a piece where some of the banks are reducing their fees. Mm -hmm. So we'll to be using all of the depositors. So as the federal program is so burdensome, and we really we just can't use it, is it because of rising house prices, or is it because of interest rates, or what's what are the challenges of that? Rising house have, prices. Yeah, okay. there's like a maximum house price gotcha. that there is very few in that price range available in our market, and then the person has to qualify. And so people come in, we get applicants all the time, and they can qualify for 300,000, and there's nothing there. Right. There's just nothing. Um, so we gotta dig in and see, can we use it, or should we really like, scrap that program, repurpose it, and do something else? So. Because I don't expect things to just suddenly get better where we could use it more. If there were, if there's a pool of funds available somehow through whatever, um, there's an organization, IDF, which you might be familiar with, that helps municipalities manage down payment assistance programs for their employees. And that might jumpstart it for you guys. If you I'll know. send you your request contact. Thank you. Thank you. That would be great. Yeah. And the PIE program is really cool because it's for for low income folks to start saving and they get assigned, they, they open up a checking or a savings account and then um, they make realistic contributions to their savings account and then at the end of, I don't remember how long, how many years it is, the county is matching their funds 100% and they could walk away with $5,000 that they could either use for education purposes or to put a down payment on a home. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll look into that and send you that. Great. One of the things we built into the contract, knowing all of this, the risk, I mean, because there's risk all over, um, is that the builder does have the ability, if we're not able to sell the home within 90 days of CO, 60 or 90 days, uh, six. 60 days of CO, we can create a, a lease purchase option. Um, because I've done that in another community, which does help the same individuals because you figure out how you lease and how you build the equity. And, and so that's that's in the mix too, in case that happens. Um, this was, just so you all know, and I'm giving you more information, so if you hear people chattering, you can uh, uh, correct it. This was completely an open book deal. And what I mean by open book is we understand where the lending's gonna come from, where the, what the interest rates are, what the, all the soft costs are, um, even the developer's equity or the developer fee is, um, you know, so they agreed to a fixed developer fee of $8 million, which is pretty important because on the lending side, the lenders are requiring a certain amount of money because if we get in a, another inflation cycle, we have to eat out of that. So that's a fixed development fee, and when you look at the eight million on the total project cost, that's a reasonable percentage of the. We calculated it two ways. If you include the city's investment, it's like fifteen percent. If if you no, if you don't include the city's investment, it's like a fifteen percent return. If you include the city's investment, it's like a ten percent return. And so for us in that type of project with the risk, we thought that was reasonable based on what we've seen in other places. And then the developer agreed in the contract to, if there's any savings on it, 75% uh, of the savings is returned to the city and they get 25%. So I say all of this because it was as transparent uh, a deal as, as I've ever been involved in and that was the point of all of our ordinances is if you're willing to share and teach us and let us see everything works you need to that gives us the ability to do more and um, um, vertical construction which is um, Walker thrash and it's the part of the I guess it's an offshoot of the thrash group which 
ironically, that he was introduced to us because the Thrash Group is the one building on the Dell across the street. And then, so that's his brother and his dad. He's been doing this vertical construction, and for the last five years, he's been trying to figure out how to build workforce sustainable housing. And he met Jessica Erickson when she was with the LADP, and he was saying what he wanted to do. This is the unsolicited proposal. And Jessica's like, you really need to meet this guy. And he, he slid in and and said, yeah, I want to do this. And, and to give you a sense of what he's investing in it, so he's working with an ad agency and a film crew, so they have been documenting this via video. And we've done interviews with him. And he's working with a group out of DC. Yeah. With, PR, PR and marketing. Piece. So he's investing a lot of his own money because assuming that this will work, this thing's going to probably go national. It's, a, it's a big experiment yeah. pilot project that he, if this works, he wants to replicate. He is working with Erie right now to do some, it's all for sale. He doesn't do rental, but yeah, well, we have so eight far. units that we have to do for sale at Willoughby. That's so that's not a thing. So. He's, he's got something going in Erie. He did a ton of the work that's in downtown Westminster. Okay. So it is a, um, it's kind of split. Mississippi is where Thrash Group is from, but he is centered out of Louisville. So it's yeah. a I'm local firm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they're, you know, it's fortuitous. I mean, it was actually the hotel that kind of jump started all of these conversations. So. And I tell you this because in the back of my mind, at some point, I'm, I know we have Health and Human Services Advisory Board, but as I'm thinking about housing and the middle income housing and your advisory role, I think there's a part of, in my mind where I'm starting to really think about this is there's a part where a lot of this I think is better here than it does in other areas, and so I'm going to be trying to reconcile that because you all understand building economics and those issues versus our health and human service advisory board is not geared in the same way. So just know that's in the back of my mind. So no organizational thing. <laughs> yeah, I know. I was like, eh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, How's go. Zinnia going? Zinnia's doing good. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, it's going great. It's vertical. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the operational side of Zinnia here in a minute. But um, we are working with them. Everything's going smooth with construction. They, they coordinate with um, suites, property side, um, everything. We're trying to figure out you know, um, light bulbs and such right now to make sure it matches across the property. Um, well, hopefully, depending on us. But um, we are also talking to Element about, because they do have the option to purchase the land that's behind the suites on the north side. and. Parks is planning a trail connection back there, a pathway. And so we're trying to work with both company, companies, groups to um, just try and plan ahead. Like, I don't want to build a trail and then screw up what's been planned or vice versa. So we're working with them on kind of, it's still incredibly conceptual on what they might do back there, assuming they exercise the option. Um, but we're trying to plan ahead a little bit on what might be possible back there. The thing we're trying to accomplish with that is that if we can use parks funds to build the trail, um, because we do need that connection from Village of the Peaks to uh, Sunset, that then, and they're willing to, so what I, we talked about with them is they're willing to do the landscaping along the trail, within the trail in um, Dry Creek. Dry Creek. Mm -hmm. um, that actually is a cost offset on the development um, that Element would undertake on the property because um, they won't have that requirement to be filled in their pro forma. So we know financially it makes sense for Element to work this out because it's just offsetting the cost of a project. Um, but we're really talking about, you know, in terms of what this looks like, how how we approach it, 
do we do an attached sidewalk because we have to maximize the land space between the trail and that area. But there's a financial benefit for that property for affordable housing. We just got to figure it out. Uh, Working towards win win. Yeah. Okay, thank you. For, I knew that was going to say something. Okay. Anything on Atwood Commons either? Is that <coughs> so they did not receive a line tech award. Um, we do, they say that they are still working to sort out a way to, to try again. And that is the latest that we've heard. Um, so it's not, it's not converting to market that we know of at this point. Um, I think they're shooting to try again, but they're going to have to look at their service model, trying to, that creative piece, come up with something that's truly creative to, to gain a competitive edge. So we're waiting to hear. And that's the thing with the LIHTC that we saw. If you look at everything that received the LIHTC award, it was not the traditional LIHTC projects. They all had some unique aspects to them that went beyond just building housing. And so as more people are playing, the competition is increasing. Um, and so you have to be creative and you have to do innovative things in order to, to rise to the top. Let's look at creative things as opposed to like different know, organizations models. that we're working with. Sorry? Service models. Okay. Um, to provide services to, right. to residents. So what kind of, I mean obviously we're considering and doing a lot of that too. What sort of mm -hmm. other services uh, they're identifying? So what, what they did put in is they uh, had a, a letter from the R Center who was right across the street saying that those are income qualified there, which is a segment of them, could access R Center. Um, programs. Now that's not actually a, a unique relationship. Our center would do that anyway, but yeah. they just supported the project and said, yes, we'll make sure that this happens. I think that that wasn't enough because it wasn't a true partnership. On -site yeah, like on site, something bringing it in so that residents are not having to go out to find it. Uh, we're con It's conjecture on what the, what chapel was looking for, but it would, I think it would have to be something. I think that the reason, our, we speculate, the reason that Ascent was successful and Atwood wasn't is we did three and four bedrooms, which are very hard to fund and underwrite. And it was family focused. They had the ECE. We've got children, youth, and families that were going to come in and do on site parenting classes and um, gang prevention services and just really trying to engage the families on site rather than having it available, but people would have to go and find it. So. And, and then from there, when we look at the state's um, environmental initiatives in terms of you know, carbon reduction, you know, we included um, partnering with LPC or in, in terms of having it's an all electric facility with solar on it. And, you know, we spent a lot of time talking to them about that because they're not used to cities with electric utilities. And, and working through that. So it's really understanding what are the state initiatives. So solar ready, early child care, these issues and incorporating in as, as many of the state initiatives as you can into what you're building, um, because that's I think what shifts the needle. <clears throat> We've been in a run of three years, honestly, that I think is unprecedented for most communities because we've had, um, Christmas get awarded, then we had Element get awarded, and now we've had the Scent get awarded. So we've had a project, I think, in the last three cycles, mm -hmm. which is highly unusual in the life of the world. I um, don't expect that to continue no. necessarily. It should probably balance out at some point, which might be part of that strong communities where they're trying to yeah. spread it out a little bit more, maybe. But um, if you build it right, right, you position yourself in a way where they can't ignore you. And that was the difference with that. With it was the standard affordable housing project. That's right. It did have things for it, which was it, it basically build ready. It was yeah. very far through the entitlement process. Um, it was. It's one of those that if they get far, you did see on that line tech list, the award list, that some that were like the final phase of completion. It didn't necessarily have a creative service model, but it was closing just it closing it out. So eventually, at would because it is so close to just being a go, it should get awarded if they keep trying, but we'll see. And something else I've noticed and I've heard from our building perspective and planning, 
the services in Boulder County are not as good as they could be. Like we have had so many projects when we partnered with certain service providers in Boulder County that they just didn't deliver good quality services. Like they do the bare minimum. And so it's really hard when you think about like the permanently supported housing. You have to get really creative and start bringing in like people from outside Boulder County, really. I mean, I've been to enough, like one of the things that we're trying to solve for Boulder County is IED housing for intellectual and developmental disabilities. And there's there's nothing right now for that. In Denver, there's stuff, but trying to get organizations to come into Boulder County or come from Fort Collins, like Larsh, that's sort of what we're looking at. So if you know of organizations that provide services outside of this area, start talking to people. Get them, get them interested in coming here because we're, I don't know how you, you guys have in-house, well, a lot of in-house stuff. We're about to talk about <laughs> yes, <laughs> quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, because we're, we're at a loss. It's like, you got MHP and and the, the homeless shelters, that's it. So it's like, there's a little bit of a, um, a desert of services and service providers. Which leads us to it's this is very good segue. <laughs> so number six, yeah, I think we're, Budget for commissioners is remember exactly service for both of those needs. Okay, so all of these items under this A, B, and the sub items all are, are going to bleed together a bit. Um, recovery cap it. So recall, our idea was that we wanted to build an, an add on at the suites um, to have recovery cafe be able to do services on site. And the city committed a million dollars to for that end outcome. Um, through ARPA funds and some of our CDBGCB funds. Um, so we and undertook this feasibility model. They've been working on it through all of 2023. They got conceptual um, architecture and, and site plan. And it is a challenging site because it turns out it, practically every utility in the world it feels like is right under that building. So it was there were some challenges, but it was feasible to build. Um, the challenge came in we also were working with the investors of the suites, which are some of our more, more challenging ones to, to work with. Um, but they, we got them on board with a ground lease idea because the land is owned by the investment partnership. So they were okay with a ground lease, but the problem is Recovery Cafe was, have to, was going to have to get a mortgage to cover part of the building cost. And so, the investor is is just having a, they will not subordinate their, their loans, right? They're the primary mortgage. They will not subordinate to anything. And so Recovery Cafe was going to have a steep hill to climb to try and get approved for a mortgage for the remainder. And so to the point where it was, it, it's probably not feasible on the financing side. And so what we've been talking to them about is, um, Whatever you do, if you end up making your home base somewhere else, can you please still build in a suites service model and we would still commit some city funding to help you with your eventual location. So um, <clears throat> what you have in your packet is a draft. Generally, we've reviewed this with them other than the cost section that you'll see um, on page expense breakdown anywhere where it's going into expenses I think it's on the third page that is we're modifying that with them but in terms of the actual <coughs> service model that they have proposed here we're on board with so far um, and so we're working with them on what this would really look like but this is what they have proposed to bring at least satellite services to the suites we've got space for them to office space for them to hold their um, group meetings but um, this is kind of what we are considering now. And so this would come to the LHA board at, at the point that we finalize this. We're still telling them that you know the expenses are, we're, we're talking about a trade off here. The city is going to commit funding to um, help you get into a space in exchange. We would like services, not necessarily have to pay for the services. So that's still being ironed out. Yeah, very similar to what we did with the um, Center for People with Disabilities, mm -hmm. as well. It's six fifty. We'll sell it to you for five. Here's what you need to do. 
they didn't seem to react. I mean, they got it, and there wasn't a bad reaction. And I even said, because <clears throat> I actually know um, their chair and vice chair really well, and I'm like, have them call me if there's an issue. I, I haven't had a call from them, so I'm pretty sure there's not an issue. So in exchange for 900000 on the CDBG side, they're going to give us this, and we'll, we'll figure out a time frame because we also know it's not realistic to do it in perpetuity. But then let's us slide in to say, okay, here's how we can start contributing some operational funds to continue this. Um, we're also going to try to get the plans um, because on the other side, when plans I look for, for, the for, the for the building, because on the other side, what we've done on the city side is um, we have made significant investments into mental health services. So we told you we have a clinician one that the suites is funding, we funded two clinician threes. Um, we've also added um, some components to, um, over the last few years, we're now up to funding full four core teams. Um, we only have two fully staffed right now. Um, but we have space, we have significant space issues. And so what I'm thinking about, and uh, talked a little bit about, I may need to talk with Zach and Christina, is that as we're continuing to build out this mental health component within our organization, we're gonna need a space to house them. And it kind of makes sense that if we have plans on the other designs, we don't have room here in this area, but it may make complete sense to build that out there adjacent to the suites and that's where we start housing our some of our mental health services they're already moving into a center of excellence model to where they're working across the organization and, and so that's something that I'm starting to noodle around to see how can I do that on the city side because that is easier for us to, to deal with the subordination issues and things like that so that's kind of in my mind. And as you'll see from the next few discussions, I think it's incredibly important that we start building other things in that area because we're having issues. So leading into that, is there first any questions on the actual service model that Recovery Cup is proposing? I guess my question was, so it's essentially six hours and then drive time, right? What, what were we looking at initially in terms of just hours that specialists would be doing programs and meeting with people? Is this still about it? Like, was so it going to be this how they, limited, they, I guess? They propose the weekly recovery circles. So that's a three hour situation. By the way, this is, they want to scale this up and have more, but they just want to start with oh, okay. making sure they can bring the people in yeah. and fill the room. That makes um, sense, yeah. And so it's, it's really focused on those that are uh, trying to maintain sobriety or, or get out of addiction. And will this be open to anyone in Longmont or just the residents? So they are already open to anyone in Longmont at their current location. They're operating out of the church here up the street. This would be focused on suites residents or maybe, maybe we could bring in other LHA properties if somebody wants to join, we could help figure that out. But this is specifically for LHA residents. Um, so basically what their, their model is, they, they bring in, they do recovery circles. Uh, the people have to, they have to commit to attend a certain number to make sure that they're really actually there and investing themselves in the process. Um, and really building a community to try and get people that are working on substance abuse challenges to be able to have resources and they can tell people they can help people with resource navigation for other things as well um, connection connections with other nonprofits and that type of thing so one thing that came up at a recent psh workshop that i went to um, was the idea that when you have a service provider on site you know, the, the residents aren't required to accept the services, but the service provider is required to try to provide yes. services at all costs, in all ways, shapes, and forms. Has that idea kind of been baked into this? We have had very candid conversations okay. that that is what we were looking for, like 
through engagement and outreach, not a knock on the door, company. and they never answered, and so we never tried again. Okay. Um, Good. And we know from the Swedes community that people, they talk to each other a lot. So if we can get a couple people participating, that we would hope that that would help spread the interest too. Um, but we told them that that is one of our biggest concerns is we understand it's not mandatory, but what are you doing for outreach? Yeah. And they already have people that live at the suites that do utilize their mm -hmm. services at the church. Yeah. And that's one of their challenges there. Yeah. It's to get about there. an hour yeah. of a bus ride yeah. between yeah. connections to get there, so. Do we know how many uh, uh, tenants are suffering from addiction abuse? That's not data that we specifically yeah. collect. Um, I, it might be a mixed bag of those that say that, acknowledge that versus more in the active stage. <laughs> Sarah, what do you think? What property are you talking about? Oh, uh, yeah. I'd say at least 65%. They're facing it in some way, whether <clears throat> trying to, sorry, that's, yeah. that's minimum. And I, and that's on the spectrum from, from marijuana to fentanyl to This would be open to even people who are sober who are just yep. looking to continue to maintain that sobriety. Right. Yep. Yeah. And they're pretty successful. I mean, that's the thing is, this is a national program that came out of Seattle uh, that's now made its way across the nation. But, you know, and, and seeing the folks they work with and talking to them, they can get them engaged and keep them. The recovery cafe is actually Probably one of the most successful that I've ever seen. I mean, I, I'd agree. So, I'm going to segue into service provision at PSH. But if there's any other specific questions about this, this will we will present this to the board at some point once we've ironed out the, the details and get a finalized proposal. Um, but any questions about recovery cafe before we go into kind of services overall at the suites all right so psh i'm going to try and structure this into our umbrella issues and then dive down to what we're trying to do on each end of it overall services for permanent supportive housing generally and then for all, all across the board but we're going to focus on permanent supportive housing the funding sources out there are dismal. Um, we hope that the county tax money that starts to be available in 2025, but they have to ramp up and bring in, in tax revenues first, really have a program to fund people. But that would be an, services would be an eligible cost under that. Uh, we're hoping Prop 123 brings in more opportunities for this type of thing. So far, there's been one round that was not nearly enough to serve what people are looking for. Um, so there's potential sources on the horizon to help fund supported services. Right now, it's there's nothing. Um, in order, DOH, the state, will fund supportive services and vouchers to go with them, but they also have case management ratios of a minimum of 15 to one, preferred 12 to one, which is insane. That is like $7,000. Yes. That. And it's like not enough 50. money to even do it. Yeah. Um, so there's a, there's a broken piece there. Um, plus, I mean, right now, before we get our solutions in place, we have a property manager on site and we have our MHP person. If they are staffed up on site like a day or two, a week, we are at like an 80 to 1 ratio right now in real life which is not even close. Um, there's a ton of history with that, with how DOH funded the suites originally and what they do now, but that is what it is. So right now, we have uh, half of our vouchers at the suites are administered by mental health partners because they are the state approved administrator of DOH vouchers. We know that those that voucher program is broken as well. They they barely fund administration. And so we know that MHP is strapped for capacity and funding to even do what a DOH is requiring of them to start. However, DOH, our agreements with MHP and DOH for when the suites was put into place, 
um, say that it's supportive services. I mean, you're out, there's an outreach component that's required. There's, you know, we're supposed to be matching these DOH case management. Now, DOH, I'm sorry, MHP is having a hard time keeping staff, just like oh, a lot of agencies. Um, but it is severely under capacity, underfunded. Um, it is just not working as is. We know that for us, we could either, we could do a lot of things to try and solve this situation. Try and hit the system, going to the state, try and hit the funding cycle, which is like two years out at least, and then, or try and just solve it ourselves and go around the established process. So what we have done on the city side and LHA is fund the three clinicians. We're trying to basically, whether or not you're having capacity struggles or funding struggles, we need this, and the city and LHA have stepped up and we're going to do it. That doesn't mean we're going to say, you're off the hook, MHP or state, but we have to do something. Um, and it is, the situation is, we're in dire need. We have had, we've had, the holidays were, were tough for the Reese, but the Swedish residents. There was um, an instance with um, a tenant that was being evicted where it just got very scary very fast. And we need on-site people that are trained in de-escalation, crisis management. Um, we need that very badly. So in terms of our, our workaround, we've got our clinicians funded. We're, those fine, uh, job descriptions are being finalized right now. They should be posted here imminently. Um, we're also because of what happened over the holidays, we've modified, or I should say, we supplemented our security on site. So we have three building attendants. Um, one of them did resign because of this. It was just not, anyway, that's a choice, which I do not blame. Um, our building attendants are just for a presence on site after hours, weekends and nights. Um, but they are not trained security personnel, they're not armed. Um, so we brought in a security firm on short notice just because we were worried about the presence of this individual. Um, and so that has brought a lot of things to light. They're doing a really great job of keeping an eye out and trying to make sure that um, they're reporting to us anything that they see that is, that is not good. Um, and so we're thinking long-term, what should that model look like for clinicians, security if needed, because we have some residents that are so happy and relieved that there's security on site. We have some residents that are not so happy because now they're getting into some trouble. Um, so how do we plan for, with Zinnia coming, Zinnia will be leasing up this fall we will have 55 more PSH individuals. These are all MHP vouchers, um, all 55. They do come with Boulder Shelter providing services. So that will be something that's different from the Suites model. Um, and however, MHP, they have to work with DOH on their tenant selection. So we have worked with MHP where they'll take every other person that they refer in comes from our local case conferencing, so they have a local tie, but they do have to pull from the statewide list as well. And so working with them on Lisa is, is coming. So now that's kind of a bigger picture. I'm gonna just give the, the plan for Lisa first. Um, the element who is building Zinnia, right before Zinnia did the uh, Bluebird Boulder which is 40 units of PSH versus virtually the same model as Zinnia. They just completed construction and they just, I think they're just about done with Lisa. And so they are gonna come in, Boulder Shelter and NMHP. We're starting to talk to them here this month about preparing for Zinnia and doing the lessons learned from the Lisa process on Bluebird. So we are lucky that we are coming in second and being able to, they've already been through it once. So, those conversations are coming. As we think to next fall, with Zinnia being um, fully leased by, probably by the end of this year, we just wanna make sure we've got systems and personnel in place to be able to make it a smooth transition and 
just make sure everybody has a safe and welcoming place to live and nobody is scared or causing problems on, on either side. Part of the, I mean, there's a fight coming on this one, just to let you all know. Um, so as a result of what happened um, with the eviction of the Swedes, we had to take protection orders out on staff, we had to take protection orders out on residents, we had protection orders out on buildings. This building was one, uh, the Swedes was another. Sarah was great. And, and serving and doing stuff because we couldn't get other jurisdictions to serve. Um, we started having, Sarah and I started having a conversation that then went to Lisa and Molly. And uh, so it just kept blowing up to the point where the individual was in, in um, a hospital, um, got released um, earlier than we thought. And so we had to pull the trigger and bring in security. We just, everything that we knew, we couldn't take the risk of something really bad happening. And so we brought in security and we said, well, we're going to do it for two weeks. Thus far in the two weeks, we have probably seen and learned more about things that are happening at the suites that we've ever seen. And it's kind of like one example was they caught somebody with a gas can coming into the building. They stopped them, they wouldn't let them bring it in. We think we know what they're doing with the gas can, but you know, then all of a sudden, they let them keep it outside, they end up finding it under the gazebo. The gazebo smells like gas, so my gut is they were probably pouring it into other containers and bringing it in. What do you do with gas? You actually use gas to cut suit up there. But one of the things you can use to make meth. We've then have subsequently heard that there was a strong metallic order, odor coming out of the unit that's associated with these individuals. So then they posted it on a 24 hour notice and we went in and did our meth test and lo and behold, super high. Super high. So as a result of, there was some other, what happened with this weekend? It was the odor. <laughs> what what I think, um, is we had a suicide attempt. We had regarding the unit that you're speaking about, um, a lot of traffic in and out. One of the unauthorized staying there is going to other units in the building. So I'm working with security on identifying who those people are, what's going on, um, and. Needless to say, like Carol just said, we're seeing things that we haven't seen in a long time. That's probably, I mean, no no fault of Corinne or even Ruby. I mean, they're not up 24 7, right? They go to bed. And that's when things happen. And the security company is doing a fantastic job of identifying problems. And, and even last night, um, the gentleman that's unauthorized at the unit we're speaking about, he's been he's been going around the building, so they trespassed him, um, and he has been back as of right now. So the issue that comes that comes up is that if sh the tenant uh, invites him in, which at this point we don't we haven't had that come up, but security knows that you know the, the I went over it with him today. He's like, oh yeah, he, he's very he's very good. So um, we're working together. So it's right. No, go ahead. I was well, just going to ask if the security now and this and so is like twenty four seven for the two weeks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How, what are the prices like for that? I mean, it sounds like it's probably not sustainable. No, it's, but it is a short term price model right, right now, yeah. which okay. is higher. But they might work with us for like a long. If we did a long term, more regular. Yeah. So they sent us. So I asked for a quote. I mean, we have to go for RFP anyway because of this, but I, I asked for a quote to go, what does this look like? Right. It depends um, because um, he did send it to me and and so there's different models of, well, do you, do you only do this property? Do you do this property and then Zinnia, which I think we need to figure that out. 
that helps us a little bit because you can mix revenue and you can kind of provide the, the broader piece. There's also a component where if we hire them to actually do rounds through other properties, that, that kind of redu reduces the overall cost as well, which <coughs> helps us because then there could be more options to bring dollars into there. But my gut says that it's probably going to be somewhere between one hundred and thirty-five and two hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars a year. Now, but that's the that's cost of two our, units having to be rebuilt. Yeah. And yeah. it's, yeah. it's yeah. the cost of our three building attendants with benefits as well. So yeah. if we needed so, to, so my gut's telling me that um, since we have one vacant building attendant, one is shifting into the custodian. Mm -hmm that I'm probably just gonna to have to make the organizational decision to eliminate the three building attendant positions, capture that money, figure out what we have embedded in that, and then look, do an RFP for security, and then try to look just holistically at what, what the gap is. And I need to understand uh, Zenia too, but you're right, it's a cost of one, Met, two meth units. I mean, so all of that's in play in what we're looking at. The offshoot of this is I've been that you know, so I've been looking at the evictions and everything that we have going on. And so about three weeks ago, I went to Lisa and I said, "No hurry, but can you give me a breakdown on the evictions and who's issuing the vouchers?" When this issue blew up with this guy, I said, I need that now. And basically what I can tell you is that of the significant evictions, now non-significant evictions are failure to pay and things like that, but of the significant evictions, 70% of those evictions are MHP voucher holders. 75. 75. Okay, it went up. So 75% of those evictions are MHP voucher holders. Now, Sarah crossed through the crime-free multifamily housing program that we're now seeing that similar situation community-wide with other properties. So I asked Sarah, will you go to Bissell and these other groups and have them do the same thing? Which, an update on that, just um, their, their people, they were more than willing to give us the data, so they're gathering that. But what's interesting is that it sounds like they don't have, a, they don't have that many MHP values. Or we'll get the data regardless. So at the end of the day, what, what, I'm now, what I've now seen is that 50% is not an anomaly. You know, and so where I say that probably the fight's coming is, is that we have an organization administering vouchers on behalf of the state of Colorado that's not adhering to the contract. So we have pulled the contracts and what they're supposed to be doing pretty clear they're not doing that and up until a week ago anytime we had an issue with one of their individuals they would not engage with us something until the eviction until the eviction and then it's scrambling something happened last week and i think it's this and there's probably the state coming down on them mm -hmm. that all of a sudden they changed it but we're going to schedule a meeting and you know, our question is, unfortunately for us in Boulder County, there's not another agency that administers the, the, the voucher from the state. And we're gonna to have to potentially make a, a business decision to say, do we just jump into this program? And do we take on that role, even though we know there's gonna be an operational loss from a financial standpoint? Because there's no way, I mean, what we should see of significant evictions, this should be balanced because we're, we're, we're tapping into the same pools. And so it's a problem and um, we're, so we're getting ready to dig into it. Here's where the, where the, the fight might come. What does Housing First truly really mean? Housing first is the model that everyone accepts is, is what we should be doing. And what that really means is if you are homeless, you cannot generally see your life beyond 24 hours. If you don't know what you're gonna eat or where you're gonna sleep tonight, thinking about your life decisions tomorrow is not a thing. And so if you are first housed, then that eliminates that 24 hour period and it lets you look farther down in your life. 
and then you can start addressing things like substance abuse, jobs, or health, or all of those types of things. That's the idea. The problem is Housing First doesn't mean get people into houses and leave them alone. Housing First gets people into houses and then you come in with that stuff to help address their issues in their life. And if that second step is not happening, which our perception is that it's not, then here we are. Um, that our contract requires that. There are funding and capacity struggles, but we got to figure something out. So the we know that so because of our security, there are a lot of more minor minor violations. Somebody, you're, you're walking through the building with a marijuana joint. That is a violation of our crime-free addendum. It's not allowed by the HUD Foundation funding that pays for your voucher. Don't do that. Okay, you're going out of the building, but you're walking through, right past the security guard with it in your hand. So we've issued some warnings, like you are violating your, your lease. And there is consternation about that from MHP already. Don't you believe in housing first? Like, but you're not don't you here believe in housing first? So that is a pretty strong statement to make here in the public meeting, but we are going to be pretty open about this conversation with MHP and the state because we are trying to work around it, but that does not mean that your obligation should not be upheld. Part of it is the thought about do I say this this odd? And the answer is yes. Because at the end of the day, those individuals that we're having to deal with, when we go through the eviction process, and, and this is a key thing, the state, or when you go through an eviction, if the eviction is sealed, unless you specifically ask not to seal the eviction. Very clear that when we're going through these significant issues, my directive to Lisa is every one of these we ask to not to have it unsealed, suppress. So we're asking to unsuppress every one of these that we're dealing with because it's not fair to the other landlords in the community to know this. That's, I have a slightly different viewpoint on that. Yeah. My understanding of the law is they're suppressed until the point of judgment. And then they're unsuppressed unless there's an agreement between all the parties to continue the suppression. And it's supposed to be, the problem is administrative, I think. Yeah. They just don't get around to doing it one way or the other. Mm -hmm. So would you say that most end up suppressed? Well, I, I can tell you this in my stipulations that I do, and I don't do LHA, obviously, yeah. anymore. There's always statements in there that permanently suppress them. And in most cases, vacate the possession if they make all the agreements in the possession. Mm -hmm. That was done a couple of years ago by the legislature. And frankly, that's the, one of the only levers that exists to get people to sign agreements. The courts have you know, been kind of encouraging. Yeah. Um, and I know I heard this from some of the other media the other day, but I would say it's completely unreasonable. And I explained to them that there's a lot of legalistic reasons why I don't think does that. Well, and we're not, just to be clear, the suppression issue, it's not for non payment of rent, or it's for if this person has threatened so violence to a landlord violence. or yeah. a meth unit, where if that goes into a private uh, landlord's, then they are there yeah. forever. The thing, the thing with the whole, you know, I have some opinions about uh, some of the stuff you've been talking about, or questions maybe, which is, but. You know, one of the things, too, in eviction court is you never know what a judge is going to do. In this particular case, the judge did something, and I've seen him do this twice now, that everybody is in shock over, and that was waiving the 10 days. Because right now, by law, you cannot evict somebody for 10 days. Sheriff, sure. but I've, I've seen this judge, and I love this judge, but I've seen him twice now waive that, and we're all kind of in shock because it doesn't quite match. Now, the other side of the coin is the sheriff's sort of saying, I'm still out of the judge. The judge says, I, by law, I'm not going to do this. Um, this is not as clean as you think it is. Yeah. The other thing I wanted to say was, I was going to just bring it, this is minor compared to what you're talking about, but at the suites. But I was at one of the other properties the other day, and people were very upset because 
the manager there is going to lock the bathrooms on the first floor when she leaves because homeless people are getting in to sleep now and the damage is being done. To me, what I, what I thought of that is the answer is not locking the bathrooms. It's, do we have a security problem with these buildings that people are getting in today? If it's bad enough that we have to shut the bathrooms off, it's probably an indication there's a bigger security problem going on. So what, did you say that was at the suites? No, that was at the Arsenal, the lodge. What was that one? Lisa, Lisa was there. Okay. But, um, but that is that is true. I mean, one of the issues we have at that building, um, we, have, we have that happen. Yeah, so, you know, my question was <laughs> meeting was going to be before the time really involved was, do we, should, are we at a point where we should be considering secure round the clock security in all these buildings? Because we may have some pretty good exposures with people who are swarming in. And I know we keep telling people, don't let people in. That's never going to They let me in all the time. Now, occasionally, people know me from when I get all this all the media for the same time. But I know a lot of people that come to the door and open the door for me and have no idea who I am. And don't even ask. Yeah, I mean, part of it is, like I said earlier, it's a cost issue. Oh, I understand. Yeah, and so, yeah, that's the hard part of this is, you know, there's a personal responsibility, and then there's the organizational responsibility, and um, it's a challenge because even at Spring Creek, we had an issue where somebody was propping the door open with a rock or something. And, and so most of the issues that come from outside into the facilities, are actually the creation of the people that live within the facilities, um, which is why I'm kind of thinking about this roaming security kind of concept, if we can do it financially, because you see it in different areas. And, and what's interesting is, like we had a major problem when we took over the LHA with somebody breaking into, <clears throat> getting into the village. So we put cameras and other stuff and Hopefully in two weeks the camera thing will be resolved uh, because of all the federal funds. It's turning into just a bloody nightmare. Um, but hopefully in the two to three weeks we'll have the best value in and we can do it. But um, so cameras are going to be part of that. Uh, the way we did the best value is that cameras will be associated. With, we're asking them to let us know whether or not they have options that can also deal with access control systems and, and uh, parking systems. Because if you can integrate access control with cameras, then all of a sudden, to your point, you know, if we're seeing certain things, then we can adjust access control via technology. But yeah, I think we do need it. But the difference was a village place. We said, okay, we're going to put cameras in. Here's what you need to do. Here's what you can't do. <clears throat> and almost immediately changed it, changed the situation to where we're not experiencing the issues that we were. <clears throat> What's probably happening, and we've seen this in other properties, is that people have their own viewpoint of how they help people. And they let people in. And where they let people in, one at Fall River, where I think we had to evict this person, where they were letting unhoused individuals again and allowing them to stay in their unit and do you know Harold one thing that I think about when I look at this we have a basically a vulnerable population in all of our buildings right old, old people sick people suites is the kind of thing right? yeah. security I when I lived in I had an apartment in New York City and I used to fly back and forth every day you couldn't walk in the front door without three people asking who you were. And that was, you know, they, yeah. they were doormen, of course, they weren't armed security. But, and, and again, this building is far for it, right? But when you look at our population, as vulnerable as they are, it seems to me like that exposure is big enough that we should be looking at how we make that a primary option in terms of how we spend our money. Yeah, and I think the challenge is some of the properties can barely cover maintenance and management. And, yeah, and, and I think that's kind of where we have to, that's part of the broader financial strategy of building projects, building up the fund balance, building up the general fund, 
to where we can maybe start absorbing that down the road via the general fund. We're just not quite there yet. And um, yeah, I mean, if we had the money, I'd probably have security in every building. Um, that's but, not a person. <clears throat> Kind of what I've heard since yeah. the No, that's good because what I would say to the manager is let's not lock it. Let's look at a different door um, lock handle. There, there's a code that's required to utilize it. Yeah. So we did that. So we were having problems with our, you know, just the laundry room attached to our bottom and our small building. And once the homeless population is identified that as a place to go, so they were breaking in just, it was just a constant, we could not keep them out. So one thing that helped me with the security reinforce more is we did this, a camera and the mesh window because these were breaking the window. Um, but what ultimately helped is the tenants were properly the floor. With a rock, when they're doing their laundry, because they have a basket, they don't want to do it. But we did a coded door lock that was unique. The code was unique to that tenant, to that unit. Mm -hmm. We could read the, the door code. So we knew we had one tenant who was his son was just you know crackhead, I don't know what you call him, but he, he was giving the code to the son so his son could sleep in there because he didn't want anyone to his unit because he was a nightmare. But we knew that that person because his code was unique to his unit, so we knew that he had given that code out to someone else, mm -hmm. to the that particular person. So it we haven't had problems. Since we started doing that, yeah. I mean, we, we, we've effectively, I mean, it cost us a ton of money, but we've effectively solved it. But so it's hard for me to do it. Our boiler guy, or the guy who does the certain some real estate boiler, he was saying that there was a unit, there was a, like ours, like a B12 unit um, in Thornton, and it has the same thing. Like the homeless people are constantly, they've done all the things we did, they're still getting in. And the boiler guy, was the, the cert guy, actually discovered it. They were, they had unscrewed the air vent on the other side and the crawling through the ventilation system and entering the boiler. So they were doing all the things we did to secure the front door, but they were like permanent back. So, so we nailed, we, we, ours has the same thing. So preemptively, because he told us a story, we welded um, the grate to the, the air vent. I, it, is it an upfront cost for that thing or is it an ongoing cost for the? Uh, it's an upfront cost, yeah. Okay. So, so and then and then you, each unit has a unique code to that mm -hmm. door, and then you can also if they prop the door open, it sizes. So mm -hmm. That'd be cheaper than it used to be. It'd be way cheaper. Mm -hmm. So that way you know which tenant's code is yeah. keen and to that they they had to have given that to somebody. Yeah, and that's the access control connected to the cameras because when you can integrate them and you see an issue then the camera can connect to the access control system. So then beyond just the restroom. And so we have, the, we have the camera above yeah. the, So we have um, a company that has done snow for us. We, we started using them for snow removal because we would like put it, the cameras were, were not already how much snow, so my husband didn't have to go check each of the camera and see how many hockey pucks the snow was from the scratch, mm -hmm. right? So we started using them for that, and then we also additionally use them now for the Sure. So is that like <coughs> in such a location with the families are focused on all the doors, all the properties? Yeah, ours is direct. Exactly. Yeah, ours is a little different because it'll be working with the parks cameras. It'll be work, you know, eventually working with the everything, and so public safety will have access to it. But so will the managers, and Lisa and myself. And so initially it's just cameras, but these cameras actually move. And then when they detect somebody in the area, they zoom in um, to see what's going on. Is that live monitoring? Yeah. You can, but rarely do you have, we have the capacity to live monitor um, right now. So it couldn't be done by the emergency center, public safety, or some. So ultimately, ultimately that that yeah, is ultimately, that is Zach's, yeah. that's Zach's dream. Yeah. Um, but capacity right now, there yeah. is no way. So what we end up doing <clears throat> in our patrol room, we have a large TV and it's got about four or five cameras up, and any officer can go and change the cameras up to view a different part or or whatever, and say something comes out like right now, um, 
and they're in, in that room, they can go to that camera and then rewind it or go to the this that time, which it could be real time, and they can actually see um, the incident itself. And it's it's amazing the camera systems how we were watching. I was watching with one of the sergeant Colin uh, one day. We were looking at car park. So I was asking him to put there's some dead spots that we've had some problems at. So I was like, hey, we need to. I, I do that a lot too as far as our cameras and some of the park issues. So we were watching car park and it had zoomed in on this car. And lo and behold, the guy's sitting there smoking out of a pipe in his car. Like it, 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 the picture is super clear. Um, so we can catch a lot of things, but we don't have the full time so monitoring. So part of it in terms of capacity, what we're working on, this is city side, what we're working on organizationally is in terms of call centers, we started bringing things together. So um, Valerie Dodd, Becky Doyle, Sandy Cedar are working on, on this and then we're working on it with utilities. And that we know at some point in the near future, we're gonna to have to shift to a 24 hour call center for the next slide. And as we're thinking about that, we're going to bring public safety in because right now, for our utilities, our after hours calls go to the non emergency dispatch line, and dispatch has to handle it, which is a problem in its own right. As we're moving organizationally into this 24 hour kind of world, then to Sarah's point, what Zach and I talked about is, is literally probably looking at an operation center where there's always somebody in it and the cameras are always going, but we're talking hundreds of cameras. And so, um, and then some of the technology with this camera, with the cameras, I mean, you, they, they have audio devices on it. So hearing like banging or something, and there's things that we may be able to do, but it's, it's just a capacity issue for us right now. It's an AI. Yeah, no, there's AI built into it. And so we know the companies that are on the leading edge of that. And so hopefully they submit. Um, the cool thing about it is that we also want to mimic what, what NOLA provided is that we then give the ability for individual property owners to say, we want to participate in this program and you can buy the camera system that integrates within ours and then the individual property owners can give public safety access to it so then if something happens then you can utilize it and so that's part of our broader smart city initiative um, but that's in place but to kind of go back to where we started is on those substantial violations what we found is they probably had issues other places, but to your point, whether it's the judge or administration, they're not unsuppressing it, and so you don't know who you're getting. We're making sure that they're unsuppressed on substantial violations, but back to the housing first conversation, our point to MHP is going to be, by you not doing what you're supposed to, you're harming the client because once they create a substantial violation and we say it's unsuppressed, it's almost impossible to get housed. So I apologize that I've been typing during this conversation because we just got an email from DOH, really strongly worded, MHP has gone to DOH to complain about us. So I was writing a, a direct yeah. email back and so that you'll, you'll see that and uh, yeah. So it's happening. Life. It's happening now. Yeah. Life. So, but that raises a question. All right. Yeah. What do you do with people? I think you raised this a couple of weeks ago. You know, we have a subset of people that are not, that can't live in the environment that we created. What are we going to do with them? We're going to be homeless or are we going to create? I hate to go here. But you know, some people would say, well, they're either following the rules or they're in jail. No matter what you create, it gives the impression of a, um, of a confinement type situation with jail or field mental health hospitals. And we're kind of at a breaking point right now with that stuff. So I, I want to make sure we're talking about some really bad scenarios, but the number of residents of the suites that are trying to do good 
that should really be the message. I don't want, especially to our partners, to the state, to MHP, seeing the examples that we're taking strong action on for several individuals, that does not mean that 78 and other individuals are doing the same thing. Our, we do want to balance. We are in the same business of if we evict somebody, we know that once if they're homeless again, that is still our problem to help solve. And so yeah. we want to make sure that the messaging is not that we are hardlined. You are not welcome here. It's more that we're trying to fix a couple of bad situations to make the 78 other individuals that are doing okay safe and able to still work on their own lives. So that's something I think we gotta make sure we start with in all of these conversations to make sure that, uh, you know, just because the LHA has a partnership with the city that has a police department does not mean that we are just coming in and cleaning house. And I don't want that perception to be out there. Um, I think that there's a, there's a broader issue in just the in the nation around homelessness and housing as a housing provider, you know, the, the housing first model, it's really hard mm -hmm. to do it when you have investors and lenders, right? And it's business and they don't want to see these people housed because it's affecting their return. Mm -hmm. right? it's, it's almost like there needs to be a separate category of service and housing if that if, if that is really the model that's going to work there there are people who believe that you should be allowed if it's housing first you should be allowed to use meth in your unit you know if that's what you have to do to survive that's great in theory but you're putting other people at risk you're putting the whole entire building at risk you're putting the lenders and investors are not they don't care they're there to make money i mean that's the the lie tech side of it it's a business. They're not doing it out of the goodness of their hearts. Banks aren't lending, you know, millions of dollars in construction and permanent financing because it makes them feel good. They're required to, by law, to invest in the community where they have their own over banks. So the, the perception that everyone's in it for the warm fuzzies, it's not true. Not really. I mean, that's what it really comes down to. People like us, yes, we want to see people thrive but we're at the mercy of this, this entire system that is built to fail those vulnerable people. So I, I totally agree with you. But we're, our hands are tied in, in some ways. But I think also going to Molly's point um, and what's going on right now, there, there needs to be a sense of accountability. And there needs to be a sense of these, you know, whether you live in your own home, we, I mean, I, I was just fighting with my son last night. I mean, we have rules, right? We have rules no matter where you live. And when you live in a, in a community like the Swedes, there there has to be, you have your lease, you have your community rules. You know, these are things, you have quiet hours. You, you have to have accountability. And when you lose this sense of accountability, it's mayhem. And that's, that's ultimately, um, I'm not saying mayhem right now, but what I'm saying is that if we don't start holding these folks accountable, then it will turn to mayhem. Well, and, and then there's the other issue, right? So we're on the other side with the tenants that are following the rules mm -hmm. that are coming to us going, I can't sleep at night because of all of this noise, scared. I can't do this, or I'm scared, and you need to do something about it. And so you get put in between these these two groups, and at the end of the day, the ones that are complaining, right? It's this activity is um, not allowing them to live in a safe, peaceful environment where they can be successful. And so, you know, for the most part, you know, we're pretty tolerant on issues and do creative things to solve it. It's it's when those individuals refuse to do it and you just keep going and you know it, it's a systemic issue so quick question from uh, this letter we just talked about what does that really mean to us um 
what I think we need to do is make sure DOH, MHP, and us have a frank and transparent conversation to make sure we all understand who is actually responsible for what when it comes to supportive services, knowing that there are funding challenges and capacity challenges, but who is actually responsible and who is actually taking the steps to try and make this right. Um, I think that, that there hasn't been a three-way conversation in recent years at least, um, partly because there's Everyone's just working with old systems because there's nothing out there to create a new system right now. Um, I think everybody just needs to know the real world on the ground, not just seeing a report on a piece of paper that you get once a quarter that shows that you're meeting your you know requirements set by the state. It's it needs to be much more of a um, of a conversation about what this is like day in the life. Because I think there's a complete gap in understanding of funding this from the very top level versus operating this on the ground level. I would really just talk about the suites too, with Xenia doing a lease up as well. And HP is there are things we need this, to this get on the same page about before we right. go there. Go there. Yeah, and I think the conversation is really interesting because we have the data to show, and I, and I don't think DOH knows this, and MHP I don't think knows this, but we have the data in hand to show that we're all tapping into the same populations, but there is a distinct difference, whether it's tenant selection process or how we're engaging with the residents in terms of the success of those that are the 50% that LHA deals with and the 50% that MHP deals with. And so in this, Molly made this point, is that we're gonna take a very tactical position to, to work off data and facts, not off of perception and hyperbole. And it's gonna be, I think, incredibly hard for MHP to reconcile those issues. And you know, on the other side of it is, I think we all agree that it's a systemic failure. And I think that's a product of what we see come out of the state on a regular basis. Um, and I can't tell you how many programs we've dealt with that they build it or they're building the plane as it's flying. And you can't ground truth it. It doesn't make sense. Whether that's the Miha project, whether it's the family leave that they're building. And and so I think it's having that frank conversation because I think we have enough information that I'm willing to have a public conversation with the council in an open session and, and discuss these issues. And I'm gonna tell them that is I'm responsible to the board and we're talking about this, but I have to talk to two boards in a public session, and I'm more than willing to do it. Because we can't allow this to be swept under the rug, because it is penalizing way too many people in our facilities. And people struggling with addiction to where we know there's something happening and we can see them moving into other units. We know that's occurring, and, and how can we ask Recovery Cafe to be successful? On the other side with the DOH piece that they also don't know about is that we funded three clinicians to come in. We're working on an agreement with the Recovery Cafe. Those are things that we're doing with other sources of funding to bridge the gap that they're not providing funding to handle. And I can talk about that publicly all day long because I think people have to start bringing this stuff out. Otherwise, we have a lot of people that need help that aren't going to be successful. And for us, we still deal with those individuals even with the eviction because they stay in our community and it's just another arm of our organization that's having to deal with that, whether it's lead, core, police, senior services. And so it's not like we're just wiping our hands of these individuals we're still dealing with them. And I think they don't reconcile that piece, which I think makes our argument stronger as we're dealing with it. Uh, when we find people that are, I don't know, 
Mars rotation. Do we have any kind of plan that we work with along to try to back away from that at first? I think now is a good guess. We work with people for months trying to sort out issues and bring in mediation and um, do payment plans or um, uh, I'm blanking on the world word, but mutual plans for getting things back on track. Well, and the well, eviction money, is absolutely the last resort. Money I can understand. What I'm really focused on is like the gas and well, and that's like, a different if issue. If you're up at that level, that is the risk is too high to our so asset and you. our people that are living next door to that person. That to us is that's a life safety issue. You. I mean, they were Process literally control. trying to bring a full gas can yeah, into a building. And that's building. kind of my point. Yeah. What I've seen in the eviction court, I haven't really paid that close of attention, but I haven't really seen LHA coming forward with a bunch of. Um, payment issues. It's been significant violations. Right. That started back when we started. Mm -hmm. I remember there being a significant change even before you guys came on in how much we would work with a tenant to avoid mm -hmm. eviction. I'm not really sure that that's wrong. Mm -hmm. no, that's, no, no, that's the right thing to do. What I mean is, I'm sorry, I'm not. When, when I look at the docket and the right. It's non-payment, 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 non-payment. LHA, substantial violation, substantial violation. I'm not so sure we're doing the wrong things. We're getting a lot of heat for it. But as you said, yes, <laughs> you know, meth, all these, these issues are immediate safety issues for the other. And so do we sacrifice the majority for the, the three or four? Unfortunately, it's not three or four anymore. Anyway, I think I'm done. Yeah, no, I think you're. I think you're right, and that's our approach. Is yeah. if it's something that endangers the life safety of the others that are in the building, and we've been pretty open with everyone and talking the conversations. We have zero tolerance for those. I mean, it's not like they don't know that that's our position. And in that part of the conversation, when we get to numbers, that you'll see why numbers are the way they are. Is is the direct communication. These folks. That's last, last meeting we talked about maybe once a quarter going through the eviction of the conference. Sure, and, 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 and leading to that, so we have 15 minutes yeah. left. So yeah. Do we want anything else we want to talk about? The sweets, campus, we're going to support our health. We've covered it all. And we're not doing property updates because it was the holidays, it was mainly for okay. resident parties. Um, the occupancy report we can go over if there's questions or if you just want to. Yes. Wait, wait, wait. Like. Do you have the eviction numbers? Is that what you were saying? You were? No, these are calls for service. Oh. Well, let's we'll go over the um, anything on the resident quality of life that anybody want to bring up. All right. Yep. Yeah. So let's go on to number eight. I'll let you report update on operations. Anything on the uh, occupancy report that anybody any questions on? Just leave it to questions today, but I'm going to cover details for time's sake. Okay. Well, there, and there's no, I'm assuming there's no additional meth units or any? No or, new ones except for the, the recent test we just got that's not reflected on here yet. Yeah, sure, sure. Not very much, but, um, public health and safety updates. All right, so, so these, um, so this first sheet, just a small box. The last three years at our properties. Um, as you can see, the, the uh, community that has the highest numbers, the one we've been discussing, nauseam. Um, this last year, we were there 487 times. That's quite a bit. If you, this other sheet breaks calls for service down for each property in the last three years in the calls for service. Um, the ones I wanted to highlight for you, um, and we can take a deep dive in the data and how we collect it, and I just want to share with you a few things that kind of should be highlighted. So when you look at the assist um, under the suites, 168 assists, and then you look at the follow-ups down below, what what those all those are all the same things 
and those are basically when we had a change when we went to our body cameras a lot of the when we said follow-up we had to change it to an assist for whatever reason our body camera and the, the, the data and the collection we had to change it so those are all basically the same thing and the majority of the folks that ever cleared a call with that were our core units or myself so that that helps with that piece um, you can see on the second page the suspicious um, the sp the suspicious situations that are called in there's 56 of the suites I believe that that number is is so high due to in the, in the last few years is due to the involvement um, with public safety and the coffee and conversations uh, in the communications with management with um, everyone everyone there and really the the residents contacting me um, and a lot of times I'll call I'm called all the time and I, I end up loading calls for people um, the welfare check 239 welfare checks in three years so over half um, over half of those I would say um, corresponded to I did pull a separate and I didn't print it out but um, we had four at the suites 152 times last year so that's that's a pretty significant number um, whether it be on a welfare check um, maybe it, it was uh, they're following up a lot of times core core units when they get a referral they follow up on, on these folks all the time and so follow-ups mental health mental health holds, welfare checks. Um, and I, I feel like the contributing factors also with some of these numbers of the suites, we, we did lose um, our resource specialist there, and I can't remember what time of year we lost Valerie. So <coughs> can you remember that? But I think, um, you know, not having that person around at all um, contributed to some of those numbers as well. Um, you can see all the other properties are pretty pretty low um, that's a really quick deep dive uh, into data and if any of you have questions or if you end up looking at this and want to have a conversation with me I can definitely do that with you I have a question about the welfare checks mm -hmm. are those mainly done by um, say people that are related to the residents or where, where are those welfare checks coming from? So who's the reporting party? Mm -hmm. So it could be a neighbor, it could be a um, mental health caseworker, like MHP, it could, I mean, there's a few of them in there, believe it or not. Um, it could, they're, they come from all over. Um, a family member, um, maybe a manager, it could be, um, coming in from a doctor to hospital. So that it's, it's a wide variety of who's reporting the welfare checks. I just wonder how, how often the families are even involved in the people that are there. That's, that's a comment. Uh, sure, yeah. The other thing that points out to me, uh, comes out to me is that uh, harassment um, of the suites is well, 58. Mm -hmm. And that's that's um, residents calling on other residents. That could be um, a resident being harassed from someone outside. Um, I could definitely dig into that piece to see how many, you know, how many resident on resident harassments we have I mean, the gentleman we were just talking about that was evicted he was charged with harassment on two residents so now they're kind of in line with the disturbances as well as that yeah baseball fight is kind of spread the state yes our numbers there mm -hmm. and that's that's just one example Anything else? Um, so that was again a quick, quick preview of the last few years. Um, 
as far as any property updates and public safety, we've really just been like we've been talking about dealing with uh, the past few weeks at the suites, um, really working with the security team there and patrol and getting information out timely was very important for public safety and for residents of the suite. So I think we did a fantastic job about hanging flyers up, communicating with residents, uh, Harold and Lisa went and talked to a few folks that were directly involved. My, I went down and spoke with um, a couple of residents with Ruby. So I think with as uh, entire staff, we did an amazing job uh, working together and making sure the residents felt comfortable and, you know, and as safe as possible. Lisa talked about it with the properties. Can you address the right and the conversation? Any questions for me? Any additional things for you, Carol? Yeah. Do you really have any other business? I just have a question about village. Uh, the village. <laughs> the village, there we go. And you probably have addressed this in the past and I've forgotten it. Um, the public solar panels that are up there, are we going to get those to a point where they're functional and can actually work for that building? So we're going to take them off because those are solar panels just to, to do a water heating system. They're not energy PV solar panels. The panels will come off. We are going to repurpose the mountings and put actual PV solar panels on. Okay. So we will have solar energy off the thing. So it's going to be like a big building? Um, not all electric because there is still gas for the boilers because that is a really hard thing to retrofit. Mm -hmm. um, but we will still offset with the panels proposed, which they're huge, offset 65% of the energy usage of the building. We're filling, filling the whole roof. <laughs> all right, and let's adjourn at 10:57. This meeting is February 13th. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.